Thank you. I, I first met Franz, uh, I was trying to do the math, I think it was 38 years ago. And uh, so he's, he's one of the oldest, my oldest friends here. And he was friends with my partner, and Yao. And I'm going to tell you about a story about analog and digital. But at that time, I had just come down from living in a tree. So and you'll think nothing, nothing's more analog than a tree or living in a tree. But so I lived up there. And down there are the cedar boards that I was splitting up to, to finish building that house. But if you take that cedar apart, so I split that wood, uh, even this tree, this analog, is actually doing a digital computation. That's what, trees are nature's way of digitizing time. So if you count the rings precisely, uh, you see that that's actually, there's 544 rings. So things can be digital, they can be analog. In a technical sense, analog computing deals with continuous functions, and digital computing deals with discrete functions. And anything I would say about this would be pure, absolutely in the shadow of our great Marvin Minsky, who, who knew this subject more deeply than almost anyone else alive until last year. Here he's uh, at the Naval, so still, don't trust your spell checker, postgraduate school at, at Google. So, Marvin was there from the beginning of, of what I like to call the New Testament of, of computing, with all the greats, with Johnny von Neumann, Ross Ashby, John McCarthy, Claude Shannon. And what Stan Ulam said 32 years ago is absolutely true today. All you need to only change one word, where he said taxpayers, now you can change that to shareholders. And Stan, so I'm going to give you the, the family history of computing. Stan and Francoise were, were friends of my mom and dad. This goes way back. So it, really the first story we have is the 13th century Roger Bacon tries to build an AI. So he does everything to make this head exactly like a human head and get it to speak and waits three weeks and nothing happens. And so he, he finally decides to raise a spirit. Just go to the devil, make a deal with the devil, get this thing to work. And I'm not going to tell you the whole story, you can look it up, but it ends badly. And this is a, a, a common theme. So then Thomas Hobbes took those ideas and made them much more rigorous, explaining in a very strict sense that all logic can be done with arithmetic and that you can have sort of what we now would call social networks that, that delegate political power. And why may we not say that all automata have an artificial life? And Leibniz made that even more rigorous, a complete system of binary computation that could be implemented by a machine without wheels. And this was an insult to his competitor, uh, Pascal, who had a machine that worked with wheels, and, and Leibniz was saying how you could do this with shift registry with no wheels at all. And then we, we get into the 19th century, Charles Babbage, Augusta Ada, who uh, brought us really what we now call, would call software, and André Marie Ampère, who coined the word cybernetics, the science of uh, cybernetics. And Alfred Smee was the first person to bring in electricity, and try and explain how the mind works in an electrical way. You have images that are reality, images that are thoughts. The power to distinguish between a thought and reality is consciousness. So he hasn't explained consciousness, but at least he's defined it. Then he works very hard to not only define it, but explain it developing what we would now call neural networks, models of how you do deep visual processing through classifier networks. They're very, very much ahead of his time. And then even, this is a paper where he explains how you could build a search engine that would do what Google does, find uh, things among vast bodies of facts. But the problem was it would have to be the size of London, and it would probably break. So what we needed was electronics, and it was John or Ambrose Fleming, who, brought, who coined the word electronics by looking at problems in the physics of an electric lamp. It's always a problem that leads to something new. So when you look at an Edison lamp, the light is going in all directions, but there were some odd particles that were going in one direction. What was going on? Those we, learned, we soon learned were electrons. And Edison oddly ignored that. He discovered it, but ignored it. But the problem with being famous is that uh, even if you 
ignore something, it, and if it's then successful, it will get named after you. So it became known as the Edison Effect and Lee DeForest, who actually has a star in Hollywood for his work on film soundtracks, he developed that into the modern vacuum tube with a control grid. So suddenly we had machines that could operate at the speed of light rather than at the speed of sound. Lewis Fry Richardson gave us everything you need to know about AI is in this one slide. A mind having a will, but capable of only two ideas. So all the principles <laughs> that we're still trying to work out are there in 1930. Now, Richardson was a very strict Quaker, a pacifist. So he realized that, that AI would, would be used by the military. So he went into weather prediction and pioneered that, doing digital models of whether he just calculated if you had 64,000 mathematicians in this great theater, they could calculate the weather as fast as the weather itself. And that's what, what Danny Hillis, one of Marvin's students, actually did, built the connection machine. Then he, the military became interested in weather prediction, came to him. So he stopped all work on weather prediction and worked on the distribution of wars in time. So now we've reached the end of the Old Testament of computing. We're getting to the New Testament. The, the person who brought us into the New Testament was Alan Turing. If you were here at, at EG two years ago, I got to interview on stage uh, Alvy Ray Smith about Alan Turing. So the, the founding text was in the Proceedings of the London Mathematical Society on computable numbers, where he proposes computing machines in a very abstract mathematical way. So that copy so destroyed was von Neumann's uh, team's personal copy. So you see how well the engineers studied that document. So in the New Testament, there are four great prophets. There's Alan Turing, who wondered whether machines could think. There's Johnny von Neumann, who wondered whether machines could reproduce. Claude Shannon, who wondered how machines would communicate with each other. And Norbert Wiener, always getting in trouble, who wondered how machines would take control. And von Neumann put that all together. He didn't build the, the computer that all our computers are modeled on, but he built, the, he assembled the team of people who built it. This all started at Los Alamos with a machine called the ENIAC, built for the army by Eckert and Mockley. And what von Neumann realized was we needed software, and Clary, his wife, did all the early programming. They needed guinea pigs, so she became one of the first coders, a new occupation which is quite widespread today. Did the first Monte Carlo simulations. Then he needed someone to build the machine. He went to Norbert Wiener and said, who could do this? There's only one guy, and his name is Julian Bigelow. He came, drove down to Princeton in his old Austin. And they got Vladimir Zorkin, who led the RCA research labs, where RCA was trying to build a digital vacuum tube, 4,000 bits, like a USB stick, done in, in vacuum tube technology. An amazing thing. They, made a proposal. This was a proposal for a network of 100 computers around the world that would predict and control the weather. And, uh, but this electron didn't get built in time. So instead, Bigelow built this high-speed drive with bicycle wheels that could read 90,000 bits per second. That's a 40-bit word. Everything, so what I'm, the whole point of this talk is that you can build digital computers using analog parts, and you can build analog computers using digital parts, which is what we're doing now. So this, they're putting all these analog bits of hardware together and making the modern digital computer. That's the first shift register, what Leibniz envisioned, now done with vacuum tubes. They used the 6J6, the most common, cheapest tube you could get at the time. Everybody made them. They were reliable. There's a twin triode, so it stores one bit. They wanted 40,000 bits of memory, so they would need 40,000 tubes. Very difficult. So instead, they used a clever hack that's been developed in Britain of storing bits on the face of a cathode ray tube, exactly the same way your touch screen works on your iPhone, using standard war surplus off the shelf five inch oscilloscope tubes. They could store a matrix of 32 by 32, 1,000 bits, put these in the machine. It was a giant V40 engine with 20 cylinders on each side. So that's five kilobytes. But all this was driven by work on nuclear bombs, particularly the hydrogen bombs. So the people we remember so well, von Neumann, Richard Feynman, Stan Ulam, 
they all got drawn into this project. The deal was if they designed the weapons for the government, they could play with the computers. There's a fourth person in that photograph, which was Nick Metropolis, who took the picture. He was the Hurley of the time. And so this was basically a deal with the devil, back to, to the 13th century. So this is a letter from von Neumann to Edward Teller, who was pushing harder than anyone else to build the hydrogen bomb. The factor four is a gift of God or of the other party. They knew they were doing the work of the devil, but it was worth it. So the result was a weapon that was 1,000 times more powerful than Hiroshima. But in exchange, they could do all these great things with the computers that we still do today. So even like looking at what we would now call artificial life, could you evolve living systems within these, this five kilobyte memory? Very interesting question. Von Neumann, some of his greatest contributions were actually as a biologist, and then, of course, looking at the brain. But what we learned, that was 1953, we discovered the structure of DNA. We learned that life is digital, but all these guys knew very clearly the brain was not at all digital. The brain was not a digital computer. They were completely different. That if you had to understand the brain, it did not operate on mathematical logic. So Ross Ashby looked at this very, his law is that any effective control system must be as complex as a system it controls. Von Neumann's law, a complex system constitutes its own simplest behavioral description. That's why it's impossible to describe things in a formal way in software. And what's called the third law, because they haven't named it after anybody yet, any system complicated enough to behave intelligently will be too complicated to understand. <laughs> that, that would seem to make a, real AI impossible, but there's a big loophole which is the loophole that we are diving full speed through today, it's entirely possible to build systems without understanding them. There's no law against that. That's what we're doing. We're building things we don't understand. This was all done very early. Everyone telling you they've got some new thing in AI, I can show you how it was done in the 1950s. This was work done by Oliver Selfridge, one of Minsky's colleagues, pandemonium, which we would now call deep learning, where you develop a, a sort of universe of demons and let them compete against each other in software. Let the good demons propagate and create more machines. This all become, has to be done probabilistically. Alan Turing was not allowed to talk about what he did in the war, so he, he laundered his ideas like a gangster laundering money. He laundered his ideas through Jack Good. So this book written by Jack Good is actually ha at least half Turing's ideas. We would now call it Bayesian networks. But Jack saying, I asked Turing whether he saw him and think should be conscious. Everybody asked, what did Turing think about that? Well, he said, yeah, he'd say so if he would otherwise be punished. It's a very good answer. So Good wrote the first paper on ultra-intelligent machines, machines that are so intelligent that we cannot understand them. And how you build these things, it's best to start with a random network because it will contain every network you might ever need. So these pioneers had all the clearer ideas that many people have today. Stan Ulam, what makes you so sure that mathematical logic corresponds to the way we think? It doesn't. We don't think. Our brains do not work in a mathematically logical way. So the importance of what's happening today, we think it's still the digital revolution, but we actually are living in an analog revolution. If you look at what's interesting stuff that's going on on the internet, is computation that is treating streams of bits exactly the way vacuum tubes treat streams of electrons. Right? So it's computing with continuous functions, with pulse frequency, with topology, with what connects where, who, what links to what, we're back to analog computing. The moral of this story, I'm going to get moralistic now, is be careful of where this power leads. So the first high-speed, all-optical digital communications network in the United States was built in the 1880s in the Southwest. It covered 100,000 square miles, and it was built to drive out the Apaches. And we're driven into Mexico. That's Geronimo, whose nephew they did was not captured until later. And when he was captured, he had 200, still 200 arrows. So he was fighting the US Army with bows and arrows. And less than 60 years later, we got to the age of nuclear weapons. That's how quickly things are changing. Back to that deal with the devil. Why, why did these people do this? Von Neumann, it's clear he made the deal because he wanted the computers. Oppenheimer. I think it's clear he made this deal because he wanted the power it gave him as a, as a public figure. And Teller, 
I think Teller was actually not such a bad guy. He did this because he really didn't trust Stalin. And Ulam, why did Ulam do it? Ulam did it because he wanted to show the world he was smarter than Teller. And he, so he actually solved the problem that Teller had not solved. I was drawn into this by my mother in, in, here in Athens, exactly where you saw the pictures in Mario's program. My mother was a group theorist, and she told me, I have vivid memories as a child of us driving in her, in her Dodge convertible up Mount Diablo with Edward Teller. I can remember that clear as day. And she was a group theorist who came to, to Princeton to, uh, well, Kurt Gödel didn't work with anybody, but she could work around him. And Gödel, by the way, would have nothing to do with the computer. Gödel was a, a pioneer of logic. He wouldn't go near that computer because he knew it was being used for designing bombs. That's my mother's outline of her monograph on Gödel's theorems. So this uh, is, my mother also saved a whole bunch of negatives. She was a photographer. So this is here, right around the corner of Carmel. I went down there this morning, but I'd already turned in my slides. I would have one of these before and after pictures. So that's Carmel, 1956. And when I was invited here, I said, well, I'm going to go look up in her diaries and find out when that trip with Teller really was. And I found it in the diary. And this is what historians do. We try and reconcile what people remember happened with what really happened. It was actually it was July 1953, so I was four months old. I can't possibly really remember that drive up Mount Diablo with Edward Teller, but I remember it clear as day because I was told about it. And that's where, why we need historians to go back and find out the real facts. I'm going to give you two sort of lessons from the whole thing. Uh, the first is the technical one that we've always believed in this argument that, well, we're safe from computers because we need programmers to program them. And as long as the humans are doing the programming, why do we have to worry? Well, that is no longer true. When you analog nature, the, the analog is infinitely better for control systems, and there is no programming. So don't take any comfort in the fact that you think the programmers are, are still in control. They're not. And the deal with the devil, everyone talks about the physicists, but what about the devil? And why, you know, the thermo, we never had a thermonuclear war. So did we win? I and mean, we got all the computers, nothing bad happened. But remember, I think that there's a possibility it actually was the other way, and that the devil could, could have said, well, I'll take the computers, and it's just waiting until you know, we trust them completely. So that's our job, is to make sure that that doesn't happen. To, to make sure, because the computer is actually a much more powerful tool of dictatorship or totalitarianism than any weapon that's ever been invented, and our job is to keep it that way. Thank you very much.